Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Inner Ear Gene Therapy, Recent Advances and Clinical Perspectives with Dr. Lucas Landiger. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. Before we get started, I just want to say thank you to Darcy Creens of Alternative Communication Services for providing CART tonight. And everybody should have captions available right now. Uh, if you click the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen, it should turn green and you should, you should see captions. Um, tonight, I, um, you can hit the raise hand button if you have a comment or question, but I would really prefer that you use the Q&A if you have a comment or question for me. Um, and that's the same place where you can pose a question to Dr. Landiger at the end of his presentation. And I will post those questions verbally to him so that becomes part of our CART transcript. Uh, Dr. Landiger uh, earned his medical degree from the Medical University of Innsbruck in Austria. He then served as a military doctor in the Austrian Army. He joined the Molecular Neurotology and Biotechnology Lab at Mass Eye and Ear in 2013. And just two days ago, Dr. Landiger completed the Boston Marathon. So I'm anxious to hear um, some more about that. And uh, I would not even be walking if I did that two days ago, but I'm really glad that uh, you're here alive and well and you finished and I can't wait to hear about that too. So go ahead and I'll let you get started. All right, great. Um, well, first of all, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for the, everybody involved in the organization and uh, of this talk. And uh, thanks to uh, the Hearing Loss Association of America for giving me this platform. Um, while I was preparing this talk, I kind of really had to figure out who the audience was. And so primarily, um, it will be patients from my understanding. However, there will be some professionals in the audience as well. So what I try to do with these slides is that I have a lot of information in the slides themselves. However, I really try to walk the patients through it and have highlighted some of the most important information in red so that the professionals can kind of follow up on this information and kind of go through uh, to the primary sources. So go to all these papers that are mentioned um, on the slides, but um, I still want to give guidance to the patients. So as patients, don't be overwhelmed by the slides. I really will try to walk you through it step by step. And um, in this talk, I'll try to present, obviously, inner ear gene therapy uh, studies that have been um, done here in our lab and other labs around the world. And we'll try to uh, just present some of these most recent advances and give you an idea of where we stand and when these potentially could become available um, for clinical use. Um, so to give you an overview of the talk, we will first start with the definition of hearing loss and what the current standard of treatment is. Then we'll talk about uh, inner ear gene therapy or gene therapy in general. Then we'll briefly discuss different approaches and how, like how genes could be targeted, uh, primarily viral vectors, but also um, CRISPR-Cas9. Some of you might have heard uh, the gene scissors um, that's um, that have been mentioned in a lot of uh, newspapers recently. We will discuss uh, certain mouse models that have been rescued um, in, so human, mouse models of human disease that can be rescued uh, with gene therapy. And then we'll briefly talk about uh, stabilization of cells versus restoration of cells, which would particularly be important for age-related hearing loss. And then as a last part, what are the hurdles on the way to the clinic, as we said? Um, so hearing loss, as we all know, is the, or not as we all know, but we know that it's a big problem and is actually the most common sensory deficit in humans. And um, just last month, the World Health Organization released a fact sheet on deafness and hearing loss. And these numbers are really like incredible if you haven't seen them before, but um, they say, or the estimates are that over 5% of the world's population has disabling hearing loss. And this number is expected to basically double up until 2050 with about 900 million people being affected then. Uh, in addition to that, about 1.1 billion young people are at risk of hearing loss. 
And the reasons for hearing loss are really um, like multifold, uh, can include uh, genetic causes, complications at birth, infectious diseases, ear infections, certain drugs, uh, specifically chemotherapeutic drugs like cisplatin or um, aminoglycosides, which is a certain type of antibiotics, um, noise, aging, et cetera. And then to give you an overview of how many patients are actually affected per basically life decade, you see in newborns is about 0.2%, school children we go up to about 0.4%, and then 16% in 18, over 18 year olds, uh, 34% in um, 65 to 69 year olds, and eventually we go up to 72% in octogenarians, which is really remarkable. So to understand hearing loss, we kind of first have to understand how hearing works in general. We have sound that comes in through the external auditory canal, hits the eardrum, and the sound is then transmitted through the ossicles, the smallest bones in the human body, to the fluid-filled inner ear, um, specifically the stapes or stirrup, that's the smallest bone in the human body, and it connects to this oval window. And then a fluid wave is created by this mechanical transduction and um, kind of tilts or deflects the hairs of certain cell type that are called hair cells. And once these hair cells or these hairs deflect, um, the a stimulus is changed from a mechanical stimulus to an electrical stimulus. And that electrical stimulus is then forwarded by the auditory nerve to the brain where we then actually hear. Um, in this schematic, you see the cochlea where we hear, which is the snail's uh, snail shaped structure here. And then we also have the vestibular part of the human inner ear that is responsible, like there's a balance part of the, of the um, human inner ear. And you can see the three semicircular canals here that are important for rotational movements. And we can see the utricle and saccule, so altogether five organs. Uh, utricle and saccule are responsible for accelatory movements, either uh, horizontally or uh, vertically. And then we can, based on where the hearing loss occurs, we can divide these um, types of hearing loss into either conductive or sensory neural hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss means everything to this oval window here, basically. So all the bones, external auditory canal, et cetera. And we currently already have multiple treatment options for that. However, the sensory neural part of the system, which would mean the cochlea, so the inner ear, and the uh, auditory nerve, right now, it's basically just the cochlea implant, although that's a really remarkable um, device, and we'll talk about the um, kind of lot of pros, but the few things that are not perfect yet um, regarding this device later in the talk. Another thing that could be used is an auditory brainstem implant in case the nerve is missing, but we won't really talk about that um, in this uh, presentation. So the current treatment options, uh, hearing aids, I mean, you're all familiar with those and what they do. There's a lot of models, but we also won't talk about that in this presentation. And basically what they do is that they simply amplify sound. Then we can also kind of change the sound transmission itself and here, uh, so, so-called middle ear prostheses or middle ear active implants are important because, for example, if we are missing the uh, ossicles, then we can simply replace them by titanium prostheses, so that's relatively straightforward, or then these um, active, middle ear active, active implants, what they do is that you have a little microphone here behind the ear and this microphone detects all the frequencies that come in and then filters these frequencies. And um, ha you have a, a little magnet in the middle ear that's attached to the middle ear ossicle or to the ossicles. And through the um, different frequencies that are detected, the number of vibrations or the, the um, kind of the uh, vibration intensity itself is determined and that can then again uh, facilitate hearing. And then cochlear implants, you might have heard about them uh, or even have one of them and they're really remarkable devices. Uh, what you have is again, this uh, outside microphone that detects the different frequencies and instead of uh, now manipulating the ossicles, what this device does is that you have this coil that goes into the snail shaped structure, so into the cochlea, and um, this device has certain outlets where you can kind of shoot electricity out 
that directly stimulates the uh, auditory nerve. And so you kind of circumvent these hair cells um, that usually make the transition from the mechanical stimulus to the electrical stimulus. So it's really uh, great that this actually works. What is gene therapy? Uh, so the idea is that you kind of introduce normal genes into cells and with those you can then replace missing or defective genes so that the cells work again as they should. Um, there's about a hundred genes that cause uh, non-syndromic hearing loss that could potentially be targeted with gene therapy. And when we compare our field, so the field of uh, ENT uh, to so ear, nose and throat, to ophthalmology, then it's really relatively sad because right now there's about uh, 30 gene therapy trials for 10 diseases of the retina, so the structure in the back of the eye. However, there's only one for a severe to profound hearing loss um, going on. And the ophthalmologists even already have one drug it's FDA approved since uh, um, December 2017. And so uh, we really have to catch up in this way. Um, this is uh, a, an image that shows how uh, a virus transduces a cell, so how a virus um, gets taken up by a cell. This is an adenovirus. Most of the talk will be focused on adeno-associated virus, which is a relatively similar virus. And the main difference is that with adenovirus, you can cause a transient expression of a gene, so just a temporary effect. While with adeno-associated virus, um, it usually really, like the gene that you want to replace, really stays there pretty much until the cell dies, so pretty much forever. At least that's the assumption right now. Um, at the moment, we don't really have the data in clinical trials that show how long, but like there have been studies that um, have shown this expression for uh, several years, up to decades. And this adenovirus kind of attaches uh, to the cell and is then being taken up by the cell. And it, the, the virus itself um, cannot uh, replicate, so cannot uh, double itself, basically. So what it needs is the machinery of the cell to actually um, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, replicate itself. So what it does is that deliver, it delivers the gene that has been loaded with into the inner part of the cell and then uh, the effects take place that we could then potentially use for the gene therapy. Uh, so what are, or we briefly have to talk about genetics as well because those have implications for therapy. And so basically every human gets uh, one gene, so it has two copies of a certain gene and one is received by the mother and the other one is received by the father. And if just one of those two has to be affected, then um, we are talking about a dominant disease. So that one of the two has to be affected that the patient's disease has the disease, then it's a dominant disease. However, if both have to be affected, then it's a recessive disease. So dominant would mean my father gives me a faulty gene, my mother gives me a healthy gene, I have the disease. Recessive disease would mean both my mother and my father have to give me the faulty gene, so I have the disease. And that is important because that means how we can, or that uh, plays a role regarding how we can treat um, these diseases. So the simple gene addition would be relevant for recessive diseases because in recessive cases, as we've just discussed, we basically have no functioning gene. And so the delivery of a copy of a normal gene um, could then just kind of uh, make the cell function again. And that's what's been done in most animal studies so far. However, uh, in a dominant case, we can also use uh, so-called gene, or we cannot use the gene addition uh, therapy, but we have our uh, strategy. But here we'd have to use a gene disruption therapy because here we have this dominant gene that will independently of there's an, if there's a normal copy, will still produce the faulty uh, kind of protein, the faulty mechanism. And so we kind of have to target that somehow. So um, by targeting that, the remaining gene uh, can then take over. And the last part is the gene editing part where with a recessive or dominant missense, what that is is completely irrelevant. Mutation, so if you just have a minor part that's uh, affected, you can then use a so-called CRISPR-Cas9, so this gene scissors, again, to replace that specific part of the um, gene. 
And the functional gene addition is also something that we'll skip for this talk. So how would the gene therapy work specifically for the inner ear? Well, we've talked about like how the hearing works. And so if we cut a piece of the cochlea out here and look into it, then we see three fluid filled chambers. The names are scalar vestibuli, scalar tympani and scalar media. It's irrelevant, but here in the scalar media, we have these inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. So one row of inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. And as we've said, the inner hair cells make this transition from the mechanical stimulus to the electrical stimulus, while these outer hair cells have more an, of an amplifying function. And in one human ear, we have about uh, 15,000 hair cells, and it's the same cell type in the vestibular system, so the five organs that we've discussed before with the semicircular canals and utricle, saccule, et cetera. And all of them have these stereocilia on top, so these hairs that give them their characteristic look and their name, and we'll see a few pictures of them afterwards. And what's interesting is that in birds, for example, these cells regenerate without any problems, while in mammals, including humans, they don't. Uh, there's just one exception. In 2014, researchers found out that in neonatal mice, so newborn mice, uh, some of these hair cells actually do regenerate. And here, supporting cells come into play. So we'll talk about those later. Those are the cells that are right next to the hair cells here. And one potential surgical approach for gene therapy would be the round window here. That's also the place where usually the cochlear implant is introduced, um, at least nowadays, uh, is introduced. And so that would be a relatively straightforward process for the injection. We've talked about the success story of the cochlear implant that has really enabled so many uh, patients to actually like, learn language and everything without any problems. However, there are still some issues, uh, namely the natural sound perception. So sound perception in general is, is not that great. Uh, frequency sensitivity, so enjoying music, for example, is uh, relatively hard. And speech discrimination in noisy environments. So if you're at a bar, for example, you have a lot of background noise, then it's really hard with these devices to actually filter out that one voice. So the goal of gene therapy is kind of to restore natural hearing. And this is the mouse inner ear, so the mouse cochlea, and we see that it's relatively similar to the human ear. We have the turns up here uh, where we actually hear with the hair cells. And then we have the oval window here and the round window that could potentially be used for gene therapy uh, and is being used for gene therapy by a lot of studies or by a lot of um, uh, groups uh, is, is right here. And sorry, I'm just trying to remove this uh, bar here from my screen. Okay, so the first study that I'm trying to present, or I'll, I'll present, um, is the Viglo 3 study. So, what that means doesn't play a role at all. But what they uh, did, and this, this was one of the first rescue studies in mouse models. Um, so, this Viglo 3 is a receptor that's only expressed in inner hair cells. And what these inner hair cells do, um, that's what we've discussed in the last few slides. And it's th right there at the connection between inner hair cells and the auditory nerve. And mice lacking this transporter are actually deaf. And it's only relevant in a few human patients, but what makes this model interesting or what made this model interesting was that these adeno-associated viruses that I mentioned before actually specifically target these inner hair cells. So that's exactly what is needed here. What is the relevant fact is that these mice usually develop here, or mice in general, usually develop hearing around two weeks after birth, whereas humans are born with hearing. So that um, is interesting in terms of timing afterwards, because potentially that would mean that if a mouse is injected immediately after birth, in humans we'd have to go into the womb, or like the, the baby had to be, it would have to be injected into the womb. Uh, in, in the womb. And if we see um, that these mouse pups who are lacking the transporter are injected with this Vigla 3, then they actually did not go deaf. So we can, this is a, a, a slide that, or a, a figure that will be used uh, in several of these studies. And what you can see here on this y-axis is the loudness level. Down here, it's like a whisper basically. And up here, it's like if a jet engine would start right next to you. So very loud. 
And these curves that you can observe are functions of uh, basically an objective hearing test. So once you see the curve, you can tell that the mouse heard that. And you can see in wild type mice, so in regular mice, healthy mice, we have these curves somewhere around here. In knockout mice, so the mice that are affected by this disease uh, where the transporter um, is uh, not there, we don't have any response at all. So those are basically death. And then in these rescued animals where this VGLUT3 was injected uh, with a virus, we can actually get responses again. So that means that these mice hurt because the VGLUT3, the specific um, transporter, was introduced into these inner hair cells. And in a different way that is depicted here, you can see um, 95 decibels, so it's really, really loud. Uh, no response at all, while the wild type animals and the uh, injected animals are actually pretty good. So that was really a remarkable uh, paper that came out in 2012. Um, what other functional rescue studies have there been? Quite a few published in the last few years. However, what, do you, what is common or what is like uh, the same in all of them is that they all talk about the inner hair cells and outer hair cells are really hard to target. And you can see that in these images where you can appreciate that all of these viruses kind of just target the inner hair cells while the three rows of outer hair cells that should be out here somewhere remain dark. And what is that dark uh, part? So everything that's green lights up with, so it, the lighting up means that it's GFP, green fluorescent protein. If a virus transduces a cell, so if a virus gets into the cell, then you can tell, them, uh, can tell it whatever it should express. And basically what it does here is that it expresses this green fluorescent protein and then the cell lights up. And that is something that researchers can use to determine where the vector goes. So for the rest of the talk, you can remember green cells are good because that means that the virus got into the cell and we could potentially deliver something into the cell, including the healthy gene. And so in this 2011 study, you can see that they tried five different serotypes and for all of these adeno-associated viruses, these inner hair cells were the most effectively transduced cochlear cell type. So it's good that it worked in this specific disease model before. However, the difficulty are these outer hair cells that I mentioned before. And here a virologist at Mass Ineer comes into play, uh, Luke Vandenberg, or specifically at Scapen's Eye Research Institute that's affiliated uh, with Mass Ineer, comes into play because what his lab did was that they looked at a computer modeled synthetic AAV. So they looked at the predicted ancestor of adeno-associated virus serotypes 1, 2, 8, and 9. So those are commonly used viruses. And what they um, were looking for uh, was that ancestor because everybody has had a cold and this adenovirus is actually the common cold virus. The adenovirus and the adeno-associated viruses are relatively similar. So our immune system um, actually recognizes these similarities and neutralizes some of these adeno-associated viruses immediately before they can even target the cells that they should target. So his lab hypothesized that this um, novel um, ancestor, predicted ancestor, could actually circumvent this pre-existing immunity. So they did a lot of high, excuse me, uh, high throughput screening in vitro, and then also in, vi in vitro means in a petri dish, and then also injected these viruses into mice. And you can see um, here AV2, AV8, so those are conventional uh, adeno-associated viruses in these columns, and ANC80 is that new virus, and you can see expression in the liver, muscle, and retina, and ANC80 seems to outperform all these other conventional adeno-associated viruses. But nobody had tried that in the ear. So we did that in the ear and we tried it on something that's called cochlear explants. Um, those are like micro dissections of these mouse inner ears and we can then grow them in culture and add certain viruses or whatever we want to them and see what they do. And in red, you can see hair cells. Um, so it's a specific hair cell marker. In blue, you can see a marker for neuronal structures. <coughs> Excuse me. And in green, we have again this GFP, so this green fluorescent protein, which means that the virus uh, went there. Every uh, 
column here represents one of the conventional viruses. And here the last um, two columns on the right are ANC80, so that's this new virus. And what you can see is that ANC80, so this new adeno-associated virus, really um, outperforms all the other adeno-associated viruses. And we were very happy when we saw that for the first time. And specifically, it was not only at the level of inner hair cells, but also outer hair cells and supporting cells. And we'll show, I'll show that to you in a few slides later. Uh, you can see that these micro dissections are really tiny. So it's really um, my thumb next to it, them. And you can see this, these white little dots, those are the explants. So mouse inner ears are really not very big. We then also tried this uh, together with, uh, or those, that this work was primarily done uh, in Jeff's Holtz lab at Harvard Medical School. Um, what they did was that they injected uh, mice with the virus, uh, the most promising vectors that we had identified uh, in vitro, so in the Petri dish. And you can see that ANC80 still outperforms all the conventional viruses. They did a bunch of studies regarding how the uptake of the virus would change the cells and it was normal in terms of how the cells reacted and how these animals then heard, again, detected with these objective um, hearing tests in a way. Again, for you to just appreciate how tiny everything is, we have a mouse pup here and that's where the injections um, then take place. So you have to expose uh, the round window back there. It takes about 10 minutes per pup once you've established the approach. Some more images of this GFP expression. So you see along the whole length of the cochlea, we do get a lot of viral expression. And as I said, specifically um, inner hair cells, but also the outer hair cells that weren't, excuse <coughs> me, that could not be reached uh, with the uh, conventional adeno-associated viruses um, are finally uh, transduced with ANC80 with a maximum follow-up of up to a month and the expression was stable, which is interesting because mice live between about two and a half or two to three years, something like that, uh, depends on the strain. And so a month is a pretty substantial amount of time. Uh, with the in vivo injections, we also, so again, showed that from the very apex, so the very top of the cochlea, up until the very base of the cochlea, so up uh, all the way to the bottom of the cochlea, so throughout the cochlea, we really had a lot of expression of this virus, which is very promising. Um, and it was so strong that we sometimes even saw it on the other side of the ear. And then we were wondering, well, how does it actually get there? And for that, we used brain slices of the mice. So we cut the brain like this. You can see the A here. So the section is called an actual section um, with this human head. And for the mouse in front here, we would have the snout. While here, we have the cerebellum, which is the posterior part of the brain back here. And you can see that this is where we get the uh, predominant GFP expression, so green fluorescent protein expression. And you can see that these cells here take it up. And so what we think is what happened is that the a virus travels to the other side through a structure that's called the cochlea aqueduct, which is a connection between the fluid of the inner ear and the cerebrospinal fluid. That's the fluid where the brain and the spinal column kind of swims in. And uh, that is actually known in rodents that this is relatively patent. And so we now have to figure out um, in how far that is translatable to larger animals, because that would then be kind of another hurdle until it actually goes into clinic because you wanna avoid that it actually goes into the brain. We also looked at the vestibular system and what you can see here in mouse tissue that we again get a lot of green cells. So it's very positive. We can actually reach them. And what's very interesting that was done by collaborators in London. Um, we actually also got it into human tissue. So in some surgeries, you actually have to go through the inner ear and um, what they do in this case, or for to resect um, vestibular schwannomas, for example, certain tumors of the auditory nerve, you have to go through the inner ear. And um, by that, you can actually get access to this precious human tissue. And you can see that we have this excellent expression also in human tissue. So it seems to be a promising candidate for clinical studies. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
this is another study that used ANK80 in adult animals. So in seven week old animals, these were injected through the posterior semicircle canal. Briefly talked about these before, but that would also be an approach that could potentially be used in humans, specifically the lateral semicircle canal seems to be accessible. And what you can see here is that again, in these adult animals that couldn't really be transduced at all until uh, now with this new virus. Um, you get a lot of outer hair cells um, at the apex, not so much at the base and not so much at the bottom of the cochlea, but it's still relatively promising. Um, other collaborators at the Harvard uh, Medical School used this virus then in a model of Usher syndrome. So that was uh, Jeff Holt's group and Gwen Jeleok's group. And what they did, or what Usher syndrome in general is, is that it's the leading cause of deaf blindness and is inherited recessively. So we know that both genes have to be affected then. And what you can see in this figure is that um, it's a scanning electron microscope, microscopy, so micrograph. And so that's the highest resolution of most of the, mic or highest resolution of basically the common microscopes that you can see. And what you can see in the, on the left side here is a wild type animal, so a healthy animal. What you can see in the middle is a um, diseased animal, so that's an animal with Usher syndrome. And what you can see on the right side here is an animal that has been injected with this ANK80 that had this protein that is missing, or that had this gene that is missing in these animals. And you can see that the hairs, um, so the stereocilia that give the hair cells their name, are really similar to these wild type, to these healthy cells um, compared to the Usher cells. So that was really remarkable that these uh, cells could be rescued to such an extent. And then they performed many additional experiments and specifically performed these hearing tests, objective hearing tests again. And what you can see here is that the control animals, so the usher animals with the disease, did not um, show any uh, thresholds at all with the hearing. So the louder it gets, again, deaf animals, no responses. While here on the right side, the animals that were injected did actually have uh, relatively nice hearing. Some of them, as the, for some of them, the hearing was as good as for wild type animals. So for as for um, as for healthy animals, and several other studies have come out since then. Um, and slightly before them, so around the same time, and used they targeted different Usher models. Um, so there's a lot of different subtypes. And they all showed, or most of them showed rescued, how, rescue. However, none of them was as um, substantial as with this novel virus, presumably because these standard adeno-associated viruses did not target the outer hair cells or cannot target the outer hair cells. Are there any other approaches that allow viruses to target more hair cells? Yes, um, another lab here at um, Harvard, in the Harvard system is working on something that's called exosomes. Um, these exosomes are small vesicles. And uh, for patients, I would just describe them as basically bubbles that are filled with information and are secreted from cells. And they enable communication between cells. These other cells then take exosomes up to process it. And these viruses um, have hijacked this approach to actually get into the cells more easily. And what this uh, lab is doing now and a very clever strategy is that they package these conventional adeno-associated viruses, excuse me, into these exosomes and therefore uh, can target more cells with this approach. And then this CRISPR-Cas9, these uh, gene scissors that we briefly had mentioned before, um, in a very interesting study that would, was published at the end of last year, um, they looked at stereo, or they had a mouse model um, where that um, specifically lacked uh, TMC1, what that is, uh, 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 something that I'll explain to you in a minute. What I want to show you here uh, is in this frog, hair cell, you can see these stereocilia again, so these hairs of the hair cells. And what you can see here is something that's called tip links. So those are these little bridges between the hairs of the hair cells. And um, this TMC1, this transmembrane channel, like gene family one, is actually part of this channel complex here that is important um, to cause the kind of, uh, or the, the movement of these uh, hair bundles. 
And in 2002, a study group uh, created a mouse that has this TMC mutation, and it showed that it leads to slow degeneration of these hair cells. They named this mouse Beethoven mouse, which is not a great name because the composer actually had a completely different type of deafness. Um, however, this mutation is also relevant in humans and has been described in a Chinese family. So what these researchers did was that they injected these so-called Beethoven mouse pups um, and then compared them to controls and this uh, protein RNA complex, so CRISPR-Cas9, uh, targets only the affected copy of the gene without influencing the other gene. So if we can get the affected copy of the gene, so the diseased copy of the gene kind of out of the way, then in theory, the healthy copy of the gene, the normal gene should take over and then the cell should be functioning again. That's what these researchers uh, hypothesized. And what you can see here on the right side, so again, we have inner hair cells here and then three rows of outer hair cells out here all along the length of the cochlea. And on the right side, so in these wild type mice, you can see that all the cells are still viable. While here on the left side, the uninjected animals, so these Beethoven mice, do have degeneration at the lower part of the cochlea, while the apex, so the top is kind of still there. And then these injected animals actually have preserved uh, cells all throughout the cochlea. So there was substantial rescue um, after the injection. And then the researchers obviously again assessed the hearing and what you can see here, again, loudness on the y-axis. So loudest level up here, uh, very quiet level down here. What you can see is that these injected animals actually heard better than the uninjected animals that were basically deaf uh, in some frequencies at least. And um, however, they were not, the rescue was not as good as for the uh, uninjected animals, the healthy animals. However, this study is really kind of a proof of concept that this gene disruption might be a potential strategy for the treatment of some forms of this dominant hearing loss. So, so far we've only talked about stabilization. Uh, what about restoration actually? And that is a different, uh, or an interesting difference between genetic hearing loss and age-related hearing loss, because for age-related hearing loss, we probably need a mix of uh, gene therapy, molecular therapy, and stem cell therapy, or just focus on, um, yeah, so there's a lot of like overlap uh, between the three fields. And as I said before, in some of these newborn mice, it is actually possible to make a transition from the supporting cells to hair cells. So some of these mice still regenerate um, hair cells. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and usually that is uh, through the switch of supporting cells into hair cells, and that has been studied extensively, and several different signaling pathways have been identified by researchers all over the world. And in a relatively recent paper, and that is lost uh, after like the maturation of the mice. So in adult mice, you cannot transition supporting cells to hair cells anymore. However, in a relatively recent paper that also came out last year, a group actually tried to combine several of these factors and then was able to make the switch from supporting cells to hair cells. So you can see here in blue the hair cells, one row of inner hair cells, three rows of outer hair cells. And then here after noise damage, for example, they would be lost, but then could be regenerated after this mix of these different factors. And so this group was really able to show that for the first time in adult animals, which would be very relevant for age-related hearing loss. And the only clinical study at the moment that targets uh, or that, that uh, is focused on gene therapy in the inner ear that I mentioned before is actually targeting 801. So that's a study that um, uh, lead or the, that uh, the lead investigator, the principal investigator is uh, Heinrich Stecker in Kansas, but then they also have, there also are sites um, at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and at Columbia in New York. And so in, to summarize, gene therapy is a potential solution to restore kind of natural hearing and hopefully millions of people affected by this hearing loss and specifically hereditary hearing loss. ANC80 seems to be a potent viral vector uh, for cochlea gene therapy and there's several mouse models that could be rescued and the best results for the major deafness genes at the moment seem to be achieved with ANC80. <coughs> Excuse me. 
because with NK80, you can also reach these outer hair cells and not just the inner hair cells. Uh, gene editing with CRISPR-Cas9 is feasible, as this last study showed um, that was published at the end of last year. But now the really important part for the patients and also for the physicians that are confronted with these questions all the time, what are the hurdles on the way to the clinic? So as we saw in the mouse model with the expression in the cerebellum, so in the brain, it's really necessary that there are studies in larger animal models, specifically for dosing, because the inner ear is so much bigger in larger animals and humans compared to mice, and also the safety issues that I mentioned before. That's kind of the last step prior to starting multiple independent human experiments. And um, what was interesting in a study that also came out last year was that a group showed that they could actually inject a sufficient volume into the inner ears of rhesus monkeys without worsening, worsening um, this objective hearing. So again, they had these uh, ABRs where they could then uh, detect the waveforms and say that the animal kind of heard it or not. And I recently uh, was um, attending a talk um, by an investigator who's working in ophthalmology. Uh, and he said that the vector correlation, the vector result correlation is under 30% between mice and humans, uh, while it's over 75% between monkeys and humans. So you can really see um, the result, like I'm also not a big fan of like large animal experiments, but if you look at these results, then it really seems to be necessary to have a larger animal model to be sure that what goes into human studies um, that is, yeah, associated with so much like risk, et cetera, um, can actually work in vivo as well and in humans as well. Then another question is, uh, can you specifically target certain cell types? And the way to do that is um, to give the vector as kind of a different key. Um, and this key is, is called promoter scientifically, because for some diseases, you just want to target uh, inner hair cells. For some diseases, you just want to target outer hair cells. For some diseases, you just want to target neuronal structures. So if you could kind of have these keys for all these different cell types, then it would be very nice um, to be able to kind of customize a treatment for every patient. For these adeno-associated vectors, there's a specific problem as well uh, regarding the size of the gene that you can actually put into them. Um, there are some approaches to try to circumvent that problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, try to uh, circumvent that problem um, with very promising results that haven't been published yet, but I heard uh, somebody talk about it the other day uh, at a conference. And um, yeah, there's several options that hopefully uh, can avoid this issue. And then the time window is another very important thing that I was talking about um, because the degeneration of cells uh, progresses in several animal models or in, 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 in many animal and human models, uh, human diseases. And so the question is, do you really have to uh, treat patients in the womb or is it sufficient to kind of do it after birth and yeah, would the results be better in the womb? And if it has to be in the womb, then it's really associated with a lot of risks and it will be really, really tricky to actually get that into the inner ear. And then also the treatment of age-related hearing loss. Are these results from that one mouse study actually translatable? And what are the results from this multi-center trial that I mentioned before, the only uh, gene therapy trial in humans at the moment? And uh, what's really exciting is that most gene therapy uh, labs have now ordered this virus and we really hope to accelerate the translational research. And then there's several more applications where definitely more research is necessary. And with that, I'd like to thank all the collaborators that have worked with us on gene therapy projects and all our funding agencies. And as Nancy said, I did run the Boston Marathon two days ago and it was really horrible weather. And if you want to support our research, then you still have time until April 30th. If you click on that link, you can read some more about me and why I decided to um, kind of try this marathon. It was my first marathon. And um, yeah, I, I finished it. I was very happy with the time as well for these conditions. And uh, 
thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Congratulations on that. <laughs> um, there are uh, a few questions that have come in that are um, very interesting. Your, your presentation was, was very interesting. It, it provides so much hope, um, so promising, this research. Um, Lauren said, if, if you get a cochlear implant, are you not a potential candidate for gene therapy? That is an excellent question. And um, that was also a big discussion about yeah, 20 years ago or so. I wasn't part of that discussion, obviously. <laughs> but um, back then, uh, people started to implant both ears. Um, so in Europe, so primarily the, the first candidates only uh, received a one-sided cochlear implant. And then about 20 years ago or so, uh, in Europe, primarily, they started to implant both sides um, of the pa or both ears of the patient and when that first started then some researchers said uh, this is madness and you have to preserve one ear for gene therapy um, and then the surgeons asked well when will it be ready and then they said yeah at a maximum of five years or so and that was 20 years ago so it's really hard to make like any predictions when it will be ready so i I'm not sure how many questions I answer there because that's usually a standard questions that I, a standard question that I get. Right. Um, but typically if there is a cochlear implant in place in that ear, you'd rather not inject it at the moment at least. However, in the future, if there still are at least these supporting cells left, then potentially if these approaches work to really like make the switch from supporting cell to hair cell, then potentially they might be candidates, but it's, it's a tricky question to answer. And mm -hmm. if you look at the, um, so I, in the slides, I also um, posted the link to this uh, current gene therapy trial and the criteria um, for the patient selection are very strict because in the first study, you really have to determine what works in a very small patient pool. And then if it works in those patients, then you can kind of expand it and uh, try to include more patients. I think there's probably several people in the audience that would, would like just to become um, in the clinical trial, trial right now, go from yeah. mouse to humans. So um, <laughs> also af after that paper, like the big paper got published with the virus, I received a lot of emails and all the collaborators received a lot of emails and yeah, but people that I really appreciate it. I mean, that people are willing to really participate in this trials, in these trials and hopefully we will be there soon. Uh, right now, unfortunately, there's only this one trial with uh, very limited criteria, but you mm -hmm. can definitely check out the website and see if you are a candidate um, for this. Okay. Um, so we've identified about 100 genes associated with hearing loss. Do these genes include both inner and outer hair cell information? Um, so it depends. Uh, it really depends on the disease uh, where, so as I said, like this VGLU3, for example, that was a specific inner hair cell problem. And that's why they could rel like fix it with the conventional AVs that target primarily the inner hair cells. Um, however, a lot of the diseases um, affect both inner and outer hair cells and that these con then these conventional vectors seem not to work so well and that's why this new vector seems to be better uh, specifically for these diseases for the animal models. Um, Tony asked, um, he said, I have hereditary hearing loss on my father's side. I'm considering getting genetic testing to identify the genes responsible for my hearing loss. Do you think getting these tests can be beneficial at this time? Um, it's, I mean, it, it might be beneficial in terms of the um, prognosis for, for him, I mean, personally, because uh, based on the um, gene that's affected, it might tell you, will I yeah, how, how will I hear in like 10 years? How will I hear in 15 years and so on? I mean, you can kind of see it from the uh, father's side already. Um, but 
yeah, I've, it, it's, it's tricky to like say anything about it without seeing the patient. And I've also like, I haven't, my clinical training is very limited at this point. So I still have to finish my residency and so on. So I'm kind of hesitant um, to answer this question and would rather recommend um, seeing somebody who really has experience with hearing and genetics in a human background and a geneticist specifically like genetic counseling. Fair enough. Uh, John says, it is my understanding that for people who have lost hearing over a period of decades, that changes have taken place in the brain, for example, reduction of volume of gray matter in the cortex. If you are successful in restoring hair cells, will the changes in the brain gradually be reversed? That is an excellent question as well. Um, so the question regarding tinnitus, for example, so the ringing in the ears. Um, and what the current hypothesis of, of tinnitus basically is, is that um, if there's not enough information that's coming in from the ears, um, then the kind of central gain is just like amped up and then the brain kind of creates this noise uh, itself. Because in tinnitus, even if you um, cut the auditory nerve that connects the inner ear and the brain, then it still doesn't go away. So it, it's probably not something that's caused just by the inner ear itself. And in patients, again, from a limited clinical experience, but in patients that do receive hearing aids, um, they usually do better with the tinnitus as well. So some of it might come back, but I think if you really have had it for, or have not done anything about your hearing loss for decades, then it might be hard to actually do something with this information that the brain all of a sudden receives. Okay. Um, Ken said, are, are patients with Meniere's disease candidates for gene therapy? I understand from my doctor that the hair cells die off in Meniere's patients. Do these hair cells regenerate? Um, that is also a good question. Um, we have looked at the vestibular system. And so in some of the uh, genetic diseases, uh, the vestibular function is affected. So in these mouse studies, for example, um, all of these mice were dizzy as well. So there are some very interesting tests that you can do with mice to figure out whether they're dizzy. You can kind of film them from the top of the cage and then see how they run, or you can put them on a, on a rotating rod. So it's actually called rotor rod and then determine how long they stay on top of that rod, or you can have them swim and see if they can keep the head um, out of the water. Um, and so with this uh, regeneration, at least in these like specifically Usher mouse models and others, um, the vestibular function was, uh, re like was, was restored as well. Um, however, in these mouse models, the hair cells kind of were still there and it was just the gene was lacking, um, the, the gene that was lacking and that was then reintroduced uh, with this viral vector. So if the hair cells are gone, so the vestibular hair cells are gone, then it will be relatively hard, at least at the moment, to kind of um, kind of grow them back. However, also in the vestibular system, you have supporting cells that could then potentially regrow into hair cells um, in the future. I mean, I'm not, yeah, we're not talking about years here. It's, it's decades probably, um, if I'd have to say anything about a timeline. So um, yeah, tricky. Okay. Um, Catherine said, um, can you talk about the role of deteriorated brain pathways in people with long-term loss? Would they be eligible for gene therapy or regeneration? Right. So that's kind of the question that I answered I so. uh, before where, yeah, it's kind of the gain, et cetera. So. Okay. Got it. Um, is effectiveness of ANC-80 versus AAV specific to mouse inner ear? Are there similar studies on other organs or organisms? Uh, organs, yes, there are uh, different studies. So the initial paper that I highlighted where they showed it in the um, liver, muscle, and uh, retina. So everywhere there, ANC-80 seemed to outperform uh, the other conventional AVs. So ANC-80 is also an adeno-associated virus. It's just a synthetic AV, so it's the first 
of a class of synthetic AVs. Um, and so in different organs, it works. Uh, regarding different species, right now, there's nothing um, published on that, whether it is translatable. So that's where we're so interested in um, kind of having larger animal models, not just for NK80, but for AVs in general. Uh, did male and female mice respond equally to the therapy? I'm sure the females did much better. Uh, <laughs> um, that is an excellent question. And the NIH actually requires us to uh, analyze male and female uh, mice uh, specifically now because uh, traditionally it's been like most of the studies were um, carried out in male mice uh, because they have um, fewer hormonal influences that, for example, play a role in noise induced hearing loss or noise exposure in general. Um, what we did for the in vivo studies was that um, we tested it in male and female mice. So in vivo studies, meaning the um, pups that were injected, um, we tested in male and female mice um, for the, and so that was the same number and pretty much the same effect. For the in vitro studies, we don't know because um, at postnatal day four, it's really hard to actually differentiate the sex. We didn't specifically look for that. Um, it's only like at a few, after a few weeks, it's relatively easy to differentiate the sex in mice, but in the very small mouse pups, it's, it's relatively hard. So we didn't do that. Okay. Um, has a gene been identified to explain cookie bite hearing loss? That, is, I have to admit that I'm not familiar with cookie it's bite. Hearing. With that term, I'm is not that, either. Is that the shape of the audiogram or? Uh, I believe so. Um, probably. Cookie bite hearing loss, yes. Yeah, exactly, that is the shape of the audiogram. Sorry, I'm not familiar with some of the uh, clinical terms uh, in English, it's not my native language, <laughs> but um, that is a good question, and I'm. I mean, I'm sure there are one of some, like one of the hundred genes uh, had, or several of the hundred genes have such a form. But I could, like, it's it's hard to give you a diagnosis now just based on this audiogram. So I don't think that that's possible. Okay, um, would hearing loss due to meningitis be similar to that of age-related hearing loss that was discussed, or is that totally different? Um. That is also a good question. And um, yeah, so it depends what is like, what was in, inflamed, if there was actually a, um, if the if the inflammation took part in the ear as well, or if it's just the, or not just, but if it's primarily the central um, parts that were affected. If it is uh, the central part, so the, the part of the brain where the, um, the processing of the signals actually takes place, then uh, I would say that it would be different than the age. Well, I'm not actually on this question. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think I'll, I'll, I can answer this question. I'm, I'm sorry. I have to pass on that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and last question um, is the talk about hair cell regeneration in birds, mice, um, and fish applicable in nature or just in research clinical trials? Uh, no. So for, I mean, for mice, um, only in the very, very neonatal mice, um, but for birds and fish, that's all applicable in nature. So they really regenerate um, their cells, um, their, their hair cells constantly, basically. Okay. Um, is there um, a reason for the for the lack of therapy trials, is it strictly because of funding or you mentioned that in the very beginning? Right, so uh, that is a good question. Um, I mean, A, the eye is just way more accessible than the ear. I mean, the inner ear is kind of encapsulated in one of the hardest bones in the human body and it's really tricky to deliver something there. Whereas in the eye, you can basically just use a syringe and inject it in there. Um, so yeah, it was just easier to kind of access that. And then funding for blindness in general is def or like hearing, or like hearing research is a relatively small community in general, whereas, um, yeah, the, the blindness foundations are, are definitely larger. So that might have played a role as well, but. Okay. And, um, if you, if you had to guess, when would you think that, um, 
there would be uh, human clinical trials? Um, I mean, there, there is already one human clinical trial, as I said, and... Um, but I'm, I, for, the, for the mass, you know, for more people to get involved in the trials. So it, so it, it def, there, I don't think that there will be clinical trials for like everybody with deafness. It will be a clinical trial for a certain disease, for Usher syndrome of that specific type, for example, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. for that syndrome with these specific um, criteria in terms of like hearing data and so on. And uh, I'd really hope that we'd have something to offer patients of like, for at least like one specific syndrome within, I don't know, the next two decades or so. Um, but it's really hard to make these predictions. As I said, I mean, right. this one person that's <laughs> 20 years ago that it would only take them five years to translate it into clinic. So you rather have to be conservative there. And uh, <laughs> It just seems that the research is so promising and, and on, the, on the verge of, of great discovery. So... I know everybody is anxious and we, we definitely like to keep up on uh, this topic. So I welcome you, you to present again, even if it uh, is from uh, Europe or wherever you may land from here. Um, and thank you so much for uh, doing the webinar. It was rather short notice, I know, and, and you really um, did a great job. Thank you again to Darcy who provided CART tonight and we'll look forward to seeing you next month when we talk about um, HLA 2018 in Minneapolis coming up in June. So good night everybody and thanks again. Good night. Thank you.